Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Amen? Amen. The first song we're going to do this morning, and we invite you to sing and worship with us. Um, so the first song is Trust in God, and it comes from Psalm 34, verse 4. This is what the Word of God promises. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me from all of my fears. Amen. So let's just praise God and thank him for every battle won, every sickness won, amen, because of the victory that we have in Jesus. Trust in God.
Welcome, church. It's a wonderful day. So excited to have all of you here. If you're visiting for the first time, we especially want you to feel welcome. And if you don't have a church yet, we'd love for this to be your church home. This truly is a family, a community that loves people, embraces people, and we're just thrilled that you're here. Amen. Kai, enthusiastic today. Thanks be to God. All right, shall we join together in the call to worship so that we might focus on God and God alone? The Lord is king, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cerebrum, let the earth quake. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. My King, Lover of Justice, you have established equity. You never have executed justice and righteousness. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain. For the Lord our God is holy. Let us stand together and sing the next hymn. You are awesome, and I sing praises to your name. Brothers and sisters, our hearts long for God, and we know we fall short of God's glory and mercy. So let us now confess to God the ways we have individually and collectively fallen short of God's grace. Pray with me, would you please? O oh God, our source and judge and destiny, today we will not hide our wrongdoings from you. We confess that we have left vows unfinished, good purposes forgotten, 
opportunities left unfulfilled, and duties unmet. We have spoken impatiently or unkindly and done ungenerous things. We have desired what we should not and lived for things that will die. We have ignored you, who are our life and peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Show us compassion and heal us. Set us anew on your path and help us to hear your voice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us continue silently and individually, lifting our own sins and failures before God. Hear now these words of assurance. In God's love and grace, we know that we are indeed cleansed from all our sins and sustained by the Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, God's ultimate sacrifice, we are forgiven. Good morning, church. Good morning. Isn't it nice that we have our young folks here that's gonna be our leaders next year, next, next time in the world? Okay. Uh, on the back of your bulletin is the, um, our bulletin information, information that you can read. I'm just gonna point out a few things and leave the rest for you to read yourself. Halloween is just a few days away, so please, we need your support. Um, your car, Mr. BJ said he will help decorate it. So please contact him and make sure your car is the one that's gonna win. <laughs> um, be aware that day and time change that um, for the Christmas pageant, our rehearsal will start not today, the next Sunday. 
from 11.30 to 1. So children, get your children involved. They can contact Dana or Sheila, okay? So we need our children representing our church in our pageant. Today is Bible study for the PW, so make sure that those who are part of that, you'll meet right after church. And the next uh, GM me meeting is this Thursday, 4 o'clock, okay? Thank you very much. church. <laughs> As Jennifer says, Halloween is just upon us. It is a week from Tuesday, and we are in need of candy, volunteers, and cars. The cars, if you are willing to donate your cars and you cannot decorate them, we will do that for you. If you have a car and you do want to decorate it and you're not sure what you want to do, we'll help you with that, or you can go to YouTube. They have an awesome span of cars that are decorated. The biggest thing we need is candy. We are low on candy. And so, if you will donate your candy, by the time you see me next Tuesday with all that candy, I will have some meat on these bones. <laughs> Please donate and come out and support us. <laughs> Thank you and bless you all. We want her to have some, some meat on her bones now. <laughs> okay, our first uh, scripture reading uh, will be come out of Nehemiah 5, verse 1 through 9. Now there was a great outcome, outcry of the people of their wives against their Jewish kin. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. We must get grain so that we may eat and stay alive. There were also those who said, we are having to pledge our fields, our vineyards, and our houses in order to get grain during the famine. And there were those who said, we are having to borrow money on our fields and vineyards to pay the king's tax. Now our flesh is the same as that of our kindred. Our children are the same as their children. And yet we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves. And some of our daughters have been ravaged. We are powerless and our fields and vineyards are now belong to others. I was very angry when I heard the outcry and these complaints. After thinking it over, I brought charges against the mobiles and the officials. I said to them, you're all taking interest from your own people. And I called a great assembly to deal with them and said to them, as far as we are able, we have bought back our Jewish kindred who have been sold to other nations. But now you are selling your own kin, who must then be bought back by us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Should you not walk in the fear of God? to prevent the taunts of the nation of our enemies. Holy wisdom, holy word. Good morning, church. The unmerciful servant. 
Okay, there have been a few firsts in my life, <clears throat> and so I'm having a skeleton trouble <laughs> here. One of those, I, I just have to say this. Just, it, so for you who have children, did the little song from Sesame Street, Bones, 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 Bones Inside of Me, so many I can count them. No? Yes? Bones, I love that. So that's, I was watching Carol. I'm not sure even if we put some flesh on her should be any bigger, but let's try. So. <laughs> Bring that candy. That's an, and I'll even taste it, as I said last week. You know, it's kind of my, my job. I'll do it. Make sure they're good. <laughs> We're still in the parables, and some of the parables, like today, are difficult. Um, they are not touchy-feely, warm cozy parables, like the lost sheep who comes home and is embraced, or the son. Or, and this is a difficult one, but thanks be to God that God can speak to us, even when it's a difficult word to hear. Join me in prayer. Holy Spirit of God, as we open your word, open our hearts. Holy Spirit of God, do a new work in us. This is all about your mercy. Let us not resist it, Lord. Let us embrace it, and in so doing, embrace others. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. This is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 through 25. Just a precursor to this, Jesus has been talking to his disciples and using children kind of as a view of be like a child, be humble, don't think more of yourself. Know that this is how you get into the kingdom, not by puffing yourself up, but by being in need. Because children, as you know, are always in need. You know, they don't drive yet. They start out just kind of like half-baked, if you ask me. But anyway, um, you, have to, you have to care for them. And Jesus is saying, you need to be dependent on me that way. And the God your Father that way. And then this happens. Then Peter came to him 
Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payments to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii and seized him by the throat. He said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. When the fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then the Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he could pay, should pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Holy wisdom, holy word. Be to God. Well, the first thing I want you to know is this, uh, the examples in here are what you might call hyperbole. They are like cute, they are over-exaggerated. They are not, there's nothing real about some of this parable. In um, The Princess Bride, I love the word inconceivable. He keeps using it, he has no idea what it means. And this seems inconceivable. But forgiveness, we all want it. I mean, we all want forgiveness. And we all need it at some point. Some of us need it more frequently, more often than others, like on a daily basis. Uh, what we do with forgiveness matters. We don't like to owe anything. And we don't like to be owed, mostly. Have you ever written a thank you note to somebody and they write you a thank you note for the thank you note? What? Can't you just say thank you? Or somebody gets you a gift and you tell them, oh, you shouldn't have done that? It's a gift. But we get uncomfortable with that. This is why it's not an easy passage. In the, in the Gospel of Matthew, the grace of forgiveness is stated more in the Gospel of Matthew, or the Gospel according to Matthew, than any of the other Gospels. The grace of forgiveness, more than any other Gospel. Now the Gospel also stresses the demand to forgive more than any other Gospel. If you don't believe me, go home and read Matthew 5. 6, 9, and here in 18. There is an expectation that as we are forgiven, we would forgive, and that's what this is about. So Peter starts, and um, in the Bible, you have a few things referring to baseball. It is the playoff, so I can't help myself, sorry. So in the beginning, in the big inning, Genesis. Well, the other one is here because Peter comes and he's talking about how many times we forgive. Should I be moving this? My good, I just hear an echo. Do you hear an echo? Would this, if I move this, be better? Or if I move closer and we, there we go. Let's see if we can do this. Um, so Peter comes in the tradition, in the Jewish tradition, you had three strikes. There we go, the baseball reference, and you're out. Three strikes, you're done. Well, Peter, who wants to feel really um, 
assured of who he is and how good he is and how great he is and how wonderful he is and how obedient he is, said, well, Lord Jesus, um, how many times should we forgive? Seven, which is like double the amount plus added one, and seven is kind of like the complete number, and oh, I've got this down, what do you think? Never ask a question you don't know the answer to. <laughs> So Jesus gives him this inconceivable answer. No, seven, 77, or really seven times seven. Now, if you begin to count that, you will not only grow weary, but you will lose count. The whole point is it's, in, it's an infinite number in scripture. It is more than you could ever count. Don't count how many times you forgive as if, oh, if I just get these checklists, then I'm done checklist off, I'm done. So Jesus tells him this parable. And if we look again at the text, we see that there is this Lord, a very powerful person, influential person, and he's decided, and in this parable, Jesus is referring to God, he's decided to call in all the debts. And so he starts with the one who owes 10,000 talents, which is in our day, probably a billion, maybe even a trillion dollars. It's just inconceivable. <laughs> But it's also hyperbole. It's just way over the top. It would take him 160 years to pay the debt. The average age is 70 at the time of Jesus if you survive childhood. It cannot happen. It just can't happen. Pay me the debt. And so the slave just falls on his knees and he pleads with them. And this is what he says. I'll pay you back, just give me time. What? Just give me time and I will pay back. He doesn't say, please forgive me. He doesn't say, I'm sorry. He doesn't say I was irresponsible. He just said, give me time, I'll pay you back, please. And the king who understands the sky is, uh, it doesn't get it. <laughs> he has pity, he has compassion. He feels for him and he just says, you know, if, if you had a check, you'd just rip it up and throw it away the debt. When we were young, we borrowed money from our parents to buy our first little home up in Pasadena. And, um, and we had a book. My dad had a book, we had a book. And every time we made a payment, we kind of checked that off until we had paid him back. And you're seminary students and the most exciting thing you're looking forward to is cloths and pickles. It takes time to pay that back. But we did. And then it was gone. Now fortunately my husband kept the books, but my dad didn't. And in his older age with dementia, he couldn't remember. Got the book out. But God takes the book and he rips it. And he gets rid of it. It's done. It's gone. The guy is, you would think he'd just be thrilled by this, so he goes out and he you know, here, here, the king has shown him mercy. You have two of my favorite words, grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That is grace is something we are given that we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. So in the movie 1995, Dead Man Walking, I don't know if you've seen it, it is a horrific movie. It is about a brutal murder of a couple, a young, young couple who were out at Lover's Lane and these two brothers came and they um, kidnapped them, raped, murdered. And um, one is on death row and the other is life imprisonment. And so a nun named um, Sister Helen has come to be kind of a spiritual counselor for um, Matthew Puncelle, Ponce, I'm not sure if I'm I don't know how they say it, but it's based in Louisiana. My dad would have corrected me in a heartbeat. But in this movie, she begins to see in him an opportunity for redemption though throughout the whole movie. He's innocent, she wants appeals, she's trying to get a sentence all these things and her mind gets really, really clouded. So in this one scene, she is driving and she's so caught up in thinking that she is speeding. 
And I know none of you can relate with that, but anyway, just go with me on this. So she is speeding, not paying attention. All of a sudden there's these lights flashing behind her. It's a cop, she gets pulled over. He walks up, he takes her license and her ID, and he looks at it, and he says, you a nun? Yes, sir. She asks how fast was she going. It's about 20 miles over the speed limit. He looks at that license that has her identity as a nun. It says, I never gave a ticket to no nun before. I gave a ticket one time to a man who worked for the IRS. I got audited the next year. <laughs> he pauses. He looks at her and he goes, I'll tell you what, sister, I'm gonna let this one slide. You watch your speed down here. And he walked away. Mercy, she deserved a ticket. Trust me, I've thought about bringing my ID and putting it with my license because once every several years I get pulled over for speeding. I'm as guilty as sin, I get it. But it sounded tempting, tempting. Mercy, not getting what we deserve. The man deserved to be thrown away forever for all that he owed, a debt so big that all of the Roman Empire wouldn't have that much money. That's the exaggeration. So the slave who owes too much leaves, and what does he do? He takes a hold of the other prisoner, or the other slave, who owes 100 denarii. He could pay that off in a few months. It's not nothing, but 100 denarii versus 10,000 talents? So he just about strangles him, and he says, you owe me and pay me now, and here's the exact same scenario. The other slave gets down on his knees and he begs him, please be patient with me and I will pay you. And it is possible that he could do that. But no, this one who's been forgiven a lot goes, no way, I'm throwing you into prison. And he throws him into prison. Because you could do that if someone owed you a debt and couldn't pay for it. Now the other slaves around are watching and the word used here is that they are grieved. They're not angry, they're grieved because they saw the mercy given to this man who owed much. And they go and they tell the king. And the king is like, you ingrate. <laughs> I forgave you all this? Do you not understand the mercy that I'm giving you? And he then says, you will now go to prison. And you'll be there until you pay that debt. Well, this is not a nice parable. I like happy endings. But Jesus then turns to his disciples and he said, if in your heart you don't have mercy, God will know this. The gospel is not about taking revenge. It's not about witch hunting to do the gospel work. It's not about shaming the outcast or someone who has harmed you. The gospel is about forgiving sin. And because Christ forgave us, we're able to forgive other people. The other two scenes in Dead Man Walking that so pierced my soul. And it's a time when it shows his mother and his younger brother came to visit him. In a calm voice, he's talking to him. And what bothered me and bothered so many of the high school students that I got permission to take to see this movie, because I thought it was a movie that caused them to struggle with redemption, is that he became human at that point. I mean, before that, he would cuss. He was a racist. He was a, a sexist, I mean, he was, he's just as horrible. Um, but then his mom comes in. He has a mom. And your heart kind of drops. And you kind of look at him a little bit differently. And at the very end, he's always, yeah, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, and his sister Helen is working with him. She finally gets him to the point where he confesses, 
I did. I murdered them. And I'm so sorry. She calls him a child or a son of God. He said, I've never been called that before. But that's what redemption is about. Not what we've done, but how God redeems us. So next to the last scene, you have Matthew Punslet going to his execution. And that's where the name Dead Man Walking comes. Because when a prisoner is taken out of the jail, at least in Louisiana, and you are walking from your prison to the execution area, you yell out, dead man walking. No stay of execution, no nothing. He's on his way. And the guard asked him, do you have any last words, Poncelet? He said, yes, I do. And then he pauses. And he looks to Wendy and he goes, Mr. Delacroix, I don't want to leave this world with any hate in my heart. I ask your forgiveness for what I've done. It was a terrible thing I'd done, taking your son away from you. And Clyde Percy, the father of the young woman, leans over to his wife and says softly, how about us? Matthew Ponslet looks at them, Mr. and Mrs. Percy, I hope my death gives you some relief. Before we said yes to Jesus, he died for us. Before we sought mercy, Christ gave it to us. Now all of us have probably at some time needed to ask for forgiveness. If you don't think so, talk to me afterwards. I can probably help you. I <laughs> But some of us have also longed for forgiveness and longed to have somebody ask us to forgive them. We see in people sometimes incredible wrongdoing and they ask for forgiveness, so do not continue to bring that sin up in their life. Let that go as they've asked for forgiveness. Don't browbeat and punish each other over it. Also, if someone has sought forgiveness, don't be telling other people about what they did wrong that hurt you. You have to let that go. And then that hate, that anger, that retribution that you feel in your heart, let that go or there is no mercy. See, here's the thing with Jesus. Matthew makes it very clear in writing the story about Jesus that to be forgiven is to forgive. Otherwise, it is cheap grace. Otherwise, there's no grace at all. In Matthew 5, 7, it says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. How can that be right? I mean, I owe, when you're a child, you know, you want a gazillion dollars. When you're a child and you do something really wrong, you, you really want a gazillion forgivenesses also. But so often we do not uh, believe that we're forgiven. And we hold on to that as if Christ is not sufficient. God reaches into the account book and he erases it. He knows what we've done. He knows what we've done. But let us be clear about the good news. Through Jesus Christ, God wants to give us a gift. Gifts are unearned. Gifts are just that. God is not keeping score. He invites us to embrace that grace, and if you embrace it, embrace it with others also. Be merciful 
as God has been merciful to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. of prayer and today what I would like for us to do is I will pray and then say Lord in your mercy and I'd like you to respond hear our prayer okay let's begin faithful God sometimes we struggle to follow where you are leading us we feel weak and wrestle in our faith the trials of life test us and we find it hard to rejoice Help us to grow in our faith and to realize that you are the most important thing in our lives. Show us how to rise above our human weaknesses and to grow stronger in our walk with you. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, help us to forgive when we feel unforgiveness. Help to experience afresh your grace in our lives. Help us to all choose to embrace your mercy not keeping score, Lord. Almighty God, help us to see that sometimes the impossible can be possible if we're willing to listen and obey you. Lord, in your mercy. Creator God, we pray for our world. Forgive us when we are ungrateful, when we fail to see the wonder of your creation in the beautiful cycle of nature. Forgive us when we take without thought or thanks. We pray for all who labor around the world to provide us with everything we think we need. We pray that they may be treated with fairness for their labors. We especially remember those who have lost their livelihood due to wars and natural disasters around the world. Lord, in your mercy. Living God, we pray for the hungry and the homeless, the broken and bereaved, for all who are feeling sad, for the sick, lonely, and the helpless, for those whose hope have been crushed, for those who are incarcerated and in prison, either waiting a sentence or waiting life out, or in states where they're waiting for their lives to be finished. 
for all the millions of people around the world whose lives have been shattered by war. Lord have mercy. We continue to pray for peace, even though this seems impossible, for peace in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza, West Bank, Lebanon and Syria. Lord, in your mercy. Father God, we pray for our families and friends, for the people who bring us joy and those who try our patience. We pray for the people we have hurt and upset, that there may be reconciliation, restoration of relationships. We thank you, Father, that through your Son we can forgive, receive forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy. Everlasting God, we pray for those who are approaching the end of their lives for their loved ones as they sit, watch, and wait with them, that they may all know your presence with them and on that journey. We also pray for all who mourn the death of someone they love, that they may be aware of your loving arms around them, offering them the warmth and comfort of your love. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Loving God, as we go from this place in a few minutes to serve you in the coming week, we pray that you will bless us with enough faith in you to believe that we can make a difference in the world by the grace and mercy you have given to us so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite the ushers to come forward at this time to receive our tithes and our offerings. Let us be faithful stewards of our time, our talents, and our money. As God has been merciful to us, let us be gracious to others as we give of all that we have back to God.
marvel at your lavish gifts to us, life and breath, food and shelter, opportunities for work and play, and most especially mercy, hope and peace in Christ. We now pledge ourselves to mirror and reflect the glory of your self-giving love, to continue in the pattern of generosity we see perfectly revealed in Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Hear now this blessing now to him who by the power at work within us is able to accomplish far more than we can ever ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen.